From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today has been provided by the following. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org. Connecting West Virginia families and businesses through high-speed Internet services. Learn more about connecting at Frontier.com. At the legislature today, it's the 59th day of the 60-day session, and the calendars of the House and Senate are packed with pending legislation. We'll have reports from both chambers tonight, and we'll wrap up the session with our longtime legislative watcher, Tom Stevens, on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. A long day for members of the House of Delegates. Lawmakers passed bills that regulate commercial dog breeding and tanning facilities, as well as the Eyewitness Identification Act, and created a spay and neuter assistance fund. But the major issue before the House today was the governor's bill to relieve overcrowding. Dave Mistich will have the story, but first, we dedicate this report tonight to Sally Henson, who recently retired after serving 20 years as secretary in the House of Delegates. Sally, members told us that you watch the legislature today every night to keep tabs on your kids, the delegates you worked with over the years. You'll see some of them here tonight. Amended in the House Judiciary and Finance Committees this week, Senate Bill 371 would allow for the supervised early release of nonviolent offenders at a judge's discretion. It was also amended to expand the drug court program to all counties by 2016 in hopes to address issues of recidivism as it relates to drug abuse. Many delegates spoke in favor of the bill as it went up for passage, including Delegate Misha Poor of Canal County. This is something I can stand on this floor and say that we get it right this time. We've not just waste taxpayers' dollars by doing studies. We've used that money to get information to figure out how do we get it right. We talk about making sure that individuals are uh, risk assessments are done to see if they are released, how will they be back into society. You know, the purpose of our penitentiary systems, and sometimes somewhere along the way we've got, we've lost this message, it is about making sure that people are rehabilitated. They are not sent there if their sentence does not require them for the rest of their lives. We are supposed to make sure, as the gentleman said from the 35th, our responsibility is not just to be stewards of the taxpayer's dollars, but also stewards of its people. House Minority Leader Tim Armstead offered four amendments to the bill during yesterday's floor session. The most contentious would have stripped the bill of the provision that would allow for six-month early release. That proposed change, as well as the other three amendments, overwhelmingly failed. Armstead rebutted Delegate Poor's comments as he spoke philosophically regarding the nature of how the bill fulfills the needs of the larger aims of the justice system. My distinguished colleague from the 37th mentioned about corrections is about rehabilitation. And I think that certainly a large part of it, but when you go to all of us who have been to law school, you remember that first class, you walk in and you talk about the correction system, and what the meaning of it, what the purpose of it is. There are actually four things that we have to balance in any correctional system. That's punishment, that's deterrence, that is incapacitation, keeping those uh, people who commit crimes away from the public to recommit crimes, and rehabilitation. And all four of those factors have to be balanced and combined. And it's a challenge, and it is always a challenge for this body or anybody to balance those correctly. Delegate Carol Miller of Cabell County made reference to data presented to the legislature from the Justice Center from the Council on State Governments. Governor Tomlin's original proposal for the bill was based on that organization's recommendations. Delegate Kelly Sabonia of Cabell County was one of a few House GOP delegates that spoke out against the bill. She argued that Armstead's amendments would have made the bill stronger. I think we missed a very good opportunity when the gentleman from Kanawha County's, our minority leader's amendments did not pass yesterday. I thought they were reasonable amendments. It gave us a, a better sense that, you know, the, the people that needed to be locked up were still going to be locked up. And what really frightens me is that there may be an ability, because of the passage of this bill, 
that someone who carries a deadly weapon on a school bus or carries explosives or chemicals to harm our children in a school may be up for consideration. After 40 minutes of debate, House Judiciary Chair Tim Miley closed arguments on Senate Bill 371 by stating that opposition to the bill was unfounded. This bill doesn't let violent offenders out early. Let me, let me make that very clear. That was said earlier. Violent offenders, A, will be serving longer, a longer term, six months longer, because six months of their good time was taken away, and now they're going to be serving with supervision. Voting against this bill will cause those violent offenders to be released with no supervision and with their good time. So they'll, they'll be serving the same term, they, or excuse me, the same amount of, that they would be serving under this bill, but no, 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 no supervision. This bill is designed to enhance public safety first and savings second, and we think this bill does that. Miley also noted that similar reforms in other states have been successful. This may be innovative for West Virginia. It's not innovative. Other states have done this and done this successfully. It's driven by data. The lady was talking about the data to refer to in helping make your decision. Other states, including Texas, is the most notable, not known for being a liberal state. They've done this and they've done it very successfully and have closed prisons. So I'm not sure what more information we want than what this nonpartisan outside third party group did and came in and provided that to us. What more information do we need? Finally, the governor's bill that seeks to reform prisons around the state passed overwhelmingly, 81 to 17. It will now be up to the Senate to decide whether they will accept the House committee amendments. For the legislature today, I'm Dave Mistich in the House of Delegates. The state Senate is preparing for its last day of this legislative session tomorrow, and that means more and more time spent on the floor trying to push through the final bills. Today, senators voted on 28 bills and had 53 read for a second time. As Ashton Mara reports, legislators are out of time to make amendments in committees and must now take those changes straight to the floor. Before the Senate even began to consider and vote on the dozens of bills on third reading, they received messages from the House. The list included Senate bills that had been amended and passed in the lower chamber. Mr. President, I move the Senate refuse to concur in the House amendments to Senate Bill Number 435 and request the House to recede therefrom. Primarily, the focus is on the home rule aspect of it, uh, the aspects that they have broadened the scope uh, from the pilot projects that we have, and therefore we ask that the, uh, the, the House re recede from their position on that. Senate Bill 435 extends and expands the Home Rule pilot project. The House passed the bill with an amendment to allow all 230 plus cities in the state to participate. Senator Herb Snyder, who backed the bill during the interim session, called the change unrealistic and predicts the bill will go into conference committee. The amendments to Senate Bill 580 were also refused by the Senate. The bill deals with procedures for dental, intern, resident and teaching permits. Ladies and gentlemen, I would uh, suggest as you look through our calendar, there are probably at least going on four pages of bills on third reading. So I'm going to ask everybody to the extent possible, stay at your seat and try to keep your, uh, your questions and uh, activity to a minimum so that we can proceed rapidly through this calendar. Senate President Jeff Kessler was asking for cooperation as they took up 28 bills for a vote. House Bill 2431 was advanced yesterday to third reading with the right to amend, and that amendment came from Senator Eric Wells. The bill provides an exemption for anyone who served on active duty in the reserves or was honorably discharged from the military to be exempted from the $100 fee for a concealed carry license. It is very well intentioned but it's bad policy. And the reason is the thought process was not put in a place in terms of where this money goes and how this money is spent. And I've contacted both of the sheriff's deputies or the sheriffs in my counties, both Kanawha and Putnam. And you need to know where this money goes. $60 goes to the sheriff of each county. That money is used to buy equipment, provide training, and bulletproof vests. 
Wells said another $15 of each fee goes toward the repair and maintenance of state courthouses and $25 to the state police to pay for several databases. I know sometimes it can be difficult to vote against different groups. And oftentimes it can be difficult to go against veterans. But I don't know a single veteran, not one worth their salt, that would want to say, take this money away, which means that our deputies may not have up-to-date vests, may not have tasers, may not have adequate training. As I started, this is a well-intentioned amendment, but it's bad policy, and at the end of the day, we're talking about putting deputies' lives in danger. I would urge support of the amendment. Senator Clark Barnes, a U.S. Army veteran, rose in support of the amendment, which was unanimously accepted on a voice vote. House Bill 2431 passed the Senate 34 to 0. The upper chamber unanimously passed all 27 other bills. That includes House Bill 2508, a governor's bill that increases the minimum capital threshold for tax increment financing, or TIF, districts from a $25 million to $75 million investment. For the legislature today, I'm Ashton Mara in the Senate. Coming up, a look at the health issues at this session. First, here's what's coming up in the Senate tomorrow. Among the bills up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, House Bill 2265 to require public, private, parochial, and church schools to include sports injury protocols in their crisis response plans. House Bill 2434, establishing equal salaries for magistrates, clerks, and staff. House Bill 2490, providing for the appointment of veteran advocates at state higher education institutions. House Bill 2498, making it a crime for any person on a grand jury to disclose the identity of an individual who will be indicted. House Bill 2513, the governor's bill improving the enforcement of drugged driving. House Bill 2717, requiring deputy sheriffs be issued bulletproof vests. House Bill 2805, making the Supreme Court public campaign financing pilot program permanent. House Bill 3157, to repeal numerous outdated, overly prescriptive, or ineffective sections of the Education Code, reflected as unneeded by the Education Efficiency Audit. House Bill 3160, to provide for a pilot initiative on governance of schools jointly established by adjoining counties. And House Bill 3161, repealing the requirement that county clerks collect $15 for each marriage license issued. This revenue was dispersed to local domestic violence shelters. We welcome back for the third installment in a series of discussions on how a bill becomes law. Our legislative expert, Tom Stevens, is with us. With nearly 40 years of experience at the Capitol, he's the president of Government Relations Specialists. His firm is also celebrating the 25th anniversary of Healthcare Highlights, a source of government and legislative health information. Tom, welcome back. So good to be here again. So good to have you back. Okay, as a bill becomes law, we've talked about many things. Now at the end of the session here, we have to talk about a conference committee. Right. When the House and the Senate disagree, most notably right now, there's a lot of them though, but most notably right now, that municipal home rule bill. Right. They appoint a conference committee. Tell us about these conference committees and how they operate. Well, first of all, it, it's important to distinguish them from a regular committee like the Education Committee or the Health Committee. Uh, those are standing committees and each, <clears throat> each side, the House and the Senate, each have one. But when a bill goes through both houses but ends up with a disagreement between the two houses, the House and the Senate, um, then the only other way to, to deal with it, if they want to come to a resolution, is for each side to appoint members to serve on a joint committee. That's the conference committee. Mm -hmm. Members are called conferees, and they get together and analyze what the positions are for each body, and then come to, kind, try to come to some kind of compromise. Mm -hmm. Recommend that back to their bodies and then have them adopt the bill as recommended by the conference committee. When do conference committees meet? Uh, well, first they have to be appointed and that's after both sides disagree. But as soon as they 
agree to disagree, then they will suggest to each other that they appoint a conference committee. Mm -hmm. So today there were mm, five or six at least, tomorrow there will be more, mm -hmm. um, and they will meet at the call of the joint chairs mm -hmm. from each side. So mm -hmm. there's no, it's not like we're going to meet at one o'clock, it may be we'll meet in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, yeah. in mm -hmm. the back of the Senate chamber. Exactly. It's right. not like this is a committee meeting where they sit around. Well, it, I've seen it where they sit around a table in a conference in Absol a committee room. Absolutely. But a lot of, I've seen them also where they're just in the back of the Senate vestibule yes. with their attorneys, right. kind of huddled together, mm -hmm. looking over the bill. Now, how much do the lawmakers actually do in the compromise? And how much do the uh, legislative attorneys do? Well, the lawmakers obviously are the policy makers, and so they're, they are going to be the ones that represent their individual uh, bodies' positions, mm -hmm. the House position and the Senate position. But the attorneys that work for each side also are responsible for the detail or the law or to analyze the disagreements and help their individual members understand, but also to help them to come to some compromise mm -hmm. agreement. So Obviously. there's a big, big player uh, by both the attorneys and okay. by the legislature. Are these meetings open to the public? They are. If you yes. can find them. If you, because they're announced very quickly. They're announced yes. very quickly and you yes. have to kind of find them. All right. 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 <clears throat> Thank you very much. Now the budget conference committee is a larger conference committee and will be appointed probably to what, tomorrow night? and then start their work on Monday. Right, the, bu the budgets from the House and the Senate are in separate bills and they're moving through the process today with an agreement that, they, that what's inside of those proposed budgets are both different from the original budget proposed by the governor, mm -hmm. but that they don't disagree, that, that they don't agree mm -hmm. yet um, on what's gonna happen. And so that's very typical. Um, yes. You know, in almost 40 years, I've never known the legislature to agree on a budget by the end of the legislative session, mm -hmm. which is midnight tomorrow. Okay. So, um, so the conference committee for the budget is is really important because they have to work out um, those differences. Um, they go through this line by line. They go they through the budget line by line yep. around the finance committee, probably mm -hmm. in the House, and go through it line by line. And it does take about a week. It does, and you know the the uh, the the number of pages. Say, for example, in the budget bills that they're working on right now are about 280 pages. Okay. So, and the, and there's fine print on lines. Yes. Talking about a four four point five billion dollar budget. So, because the legislature does not intend to finish the budget by by the close of business at midnight tomorrow. Um, the governor issues a proclamation, and he's already done that, mm -hmm. to extend the session beyond midnight tomorrow for six days in order to give both the House and the Senate uh, to analyze not only what the budget is, but what the impact of all these bills that are being passed right now have right. on revenues and expenditures, because mm -hmm. that affects the mm -hmm. budget too. Mm -hmm. And that's what takes some time. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the top three health issues at this session. What were they? Well, out of um, nearly 300 bills that were introduced during the legislative session uh, this year and about 55 that are still um, being considered by the legislature in one form or another, I think we would probably categor categorize them in a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. let's, let's say highway safety first. Um, the seatbelt bill. Seatbelt bill fits right in there, okay. and so, um, and that's a very important bill. Uh, we also uh, we also have the governor's proposal for drugged driving reform, and that bill is being worked on with differences of opinions on both sides. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be surprised to see a, a conference committee appointed to, to work out differences mm -hmm. there too. Mm -hmm. um, another category would be school health. Um, you've got the select committee over uh, on the Senate side, and you've <clears> done a, a lot of attention and programs um, on child, child and poverty, and one of the proposals out of that is to provide for free uh, breakfast and lunches the for the children. The To Achieve Act, that's right. To Achieve, yeah. exactly. 
Um, and then, you know, and you also talked earlier uh, in the show tonight about tanning beds. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, we would put that in the category of... Of health. Um, of, uh, of, yeah, health also. Probably, uh, the other one would be, and there's some ties in with other, and that would be uh, on substance abuse, which is you know, a real problem in mm -hmm. our state. Okay. And so there are bills that are ad addressing uh, the substance abuse problems too. Let me return to the first item of sure. business yeah. and get back to conference committees. Right. A conference committee often does not reach a compromise right. and the bill dies. That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the issues are contentious <clears throat> uh, because an original bill has been amended by one side or changed and then sent over to the other side where there may be just too big of a disagreement mm -hmm. to ever come together. Mm -hmm. So. It, it, it is not uncommon at all okay. for conference committees not to be able to come to an agreement. Okay, we've talked about how a bill becomes law. Once the session is over and put to bed and the budget has been determined and passed right. and put to bed, <clears throat> some very large books are printed and you've brought an example of these books. Right. Describe what these are. Well, these are <clears throat> called the acts of the legislature. and. Um, after the legislative session is completed, the um, because you can you can get the bills during the legislative session, and even get the enroll bill, which is the final bill that goes to the governor for signature. But then, what the legislature does is to to compile all the bills that are um, adopted during any one legislative session, and put them into the acts because that's what happened. Mm -hmm. The legislature acted to pass these bills. So so I, that's one that's that's one year's sample. That's there. one year of both House and Senate, just the acts of the legislature. So Correct. it's not separated into what, Senate bills and House bills. This is just the acts of the legislature. Well when you look inside of it they are they say it would say House bill okay. whatever. Are uh, these necessary anymore now that all these information well, is available on the internet? For those that, that want to get their hands on a, on, a, on a book and a hard copy, and lots of folks do, um, they are. Um, for those that you want to use the internet, you can go on the legislative website, which we talked about in an earlier show, mm -hmm. and the West Virginia Code, that is all of the acts forever, mm -hmm. all the way back to 1863, mm -hmm. are there, and you can actually search it mm -hmm. as a search engine in it, so if you wanted to look up you know, hospitals or motor vehicles or mines and mining. Um, you wouldn't have to actually get each one of these out for every year and right. try to go through it. But that's a good kind of demonstration of what goes on during the legislature, during the legislative session. Tom Stevens, it's been a pleasure having you here with us this session, and thank you very much. We'll see you next session, all right? Absolutely. All Love right. to be back. And here's a look at what's coming up in the House tomorrow. Among the bills up for passage in the House tomorrow, Senate Bill 21 requires health care providers to wear identification badges with name and title. Senate Bill 22 requiring maternity coverage for dependents under a client's health insurance plan. Senate Bill 185, the governor's bill restricting the tax credit on motor vehicles to purchases of and conversions to natural gas-fueled and liquefied petroleum gas-fueled motor vehicles. Senate Bill 190, the governor's bill to allow the Division of Highways to participate in funding a needed public-private transportation project. Senate Bill 336, to establish protocols and protections to help limit injuries to youth athletes and students and improve the treatment of them. In particular, the bill emphasizes the protocols for removal and return to play following concussions in interscholastic sports. Senate Bill 394, providing a $7,500 per year scholarship to dependent children of state police troopers who die in the line of duty. Senate Bill 423 to include those sentenced to six months in regional jails to be eligible for good time credit. Senate Bill 438, relating to the reorganization and consolidation of Bridgemont Community and Technical College and Kanawha Valley Community and Technical College into one multi-campus institution. Senate Bill 461 establishes the procedure and safeguards to be used when taking testimony of a child witness and permits a court in certain instances to permit a child witness to give testimony by closed-circuit television. 
Senate Bill 470 to permit farm wineries to sell samples and wine during the operation of fairs or festivals and on Sunday mornings of those events. And Senate Bill 652, requiring criminal background checks for home inspector applicants. And this has been the Legislature Today. Our coverage of the first regular session of the 81st West Virginia Legislature concludes tonight, but it doesn't completely end. Listen for details of the final day of the session Monday on our radio program, West Virginia Morning at 7.30 on West Virginia Public Radio. And you can see full episodes of the Legislature Today on our website, wvpubcast.org. I'm Beth Voorhees, and on behalf of everyone who works on this program, the news staff and the production staff, thank you very much for joining us. Good night. Support for the legislature today has been provided by the following. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont. Online at wvhtf.org. Families and businesses through high-speed Internet services. Learn more about connecting at Frontier.com.